What is going on everybody? Welcome to the, at least for now, final Monte Carlo and Python tutorial video. There might be more later, but for now this will do. Uh, where we left off, we were scatter plotting, just a simple 2D scatter plot of our data. And basically it looked like um, a whole lot of nothingness. Um, just very, just scattered all over, seemingly worthless. So, uh, we see no correlation so far, but as I was saying, it would be wise to add our third dimension to see the profit, because we do have one that one degree that we're not showing, and that's return on investment um, in terms of percentage, and that might be the only real change based on these variables. So with that, let's go ahead and begin building that. The next thing that we need to import, we actually just need one more thing for the 3D capability. And what we're going to do is from MPL underscore toolkits.mplot 3D import capital A X E S 3 capital D axes 3D. Now we want to notify Python uh, and matplotlib that we're going to be displaying uh, our chart in 3D. Uh, so expect 3D stuff. So to do that, we're going to say fig for figure equals plot dot figure. And just in case, figure, figure, just in case you're not reading, whenever I say plot dot figure, it's plt. So plt dot figure. And then finally, ax for axes equals fig dot add underscore sub plot. And then you give it like its ID. This is going to be one one one. And then you're going to specify projection equals 3D. So uh, we're notifying it that, hey, by the way, we're going to have another variable. So now we've done that. The only other major thing that we need to change is way down here. What we want to do is, I guess we'll leave all the variables in there for now, but we're going to replace this. And it's going to be ax.scatter. And then what we do is we're going to come down. Well, actually, let's add our uh, next variable. And that is uh, percent ROI, comma. So you should have one, two, three, four variables here. Now we're going to do, uh, we want to label the axes so we can actually see what we're plotting here. So ax.set underscore x label. And this label. The X is wager size, so wager percent size. I guess we'll just use the whole thing. Then we're going to do AX.set underscore Y label. And this is wager count. And then finally, AX.set underscore Z label. Whoops. And this one is um, percent. ROI. And that's about it. Plot.show, graph, and I think we're ready. So liberal.csv, uh, this one is one of our larger files. Let me move this over here. Liberal. Where is liberal? Here it is. Uh, so let me bring this up. So we have, at least mine, you guys might not have as many rows, but for me, I have quite a few rows. And matplotlib, I believe, plots pretty inefficiently. So let me scroll down here. How many? Almost a thousand. So 970. So mine's probably going to lag. If you have 970 or more rows, it's going to be kind of laggy, but bear with it. So, anyways, let's plot this up. It might take a second as well to come up. Okay, so here it is. Here is your 3D plot. And uh, yeah, it's a little laggy. That's okay, though. It's not horrible. Um, so this is basically our wager percent size in comparison to our ROI. So we can see that at least the wager percentage size, uh, as you bring it up, you have quite the difference in return on investment, right? Both negatively and positively. Um, and then our only other thing here would be wager count. And so as we slide this bad boy over for wager count compared to percent ROI, again, we can see that we have a lot more winners and a lot more losers when we do this. I was trying to get it to position on the bottom. It's just so laggy. Whatever. 
there we go. <laughs> so again, uh, as we go, and then here's like a here's an outlier right here. Like <laughs> nobody's even around him. Uh, you know, wager count to percent ROI. Uh, again, as you do more wagers, we seem to do better long term. Now, it would be interesting to maybe plot this up against 100,000 or more wagers because right now we cut off at 10. So it would be kind of interesting to see if this negativity uh, goes back up. And maybe I'll run a test and, and post a video if I uh, do that and find, a, find out anything interesting either way. Um, but another thing to um, to keep in mind is one each of these is only like one trader. So in theory, with the strategy, you would only be one of these dots. You can't really be all of these dots or a mean of these dots. You would only be one. Um, and to me, this looks you know fairly balanced. And as we ran our test, we saw that it was really close to 50/50. Only when we did a one million sample size did we see that it, w it was a positive, but we were running quite a few 100,000 samples and we got a lot of positives and a lot of minuses. So it could totally be the case that that positive 1 million sample test was just one of the positives and there's more negatives because this looks still pretty split. So even on a strategy that long term makes a profit, you can still turn out to be one of the losers. So with that, let me go to our uh, I made one called very conservative and this required a 5% change in either direction so here's that one a much smaller one and it, oh, it feels so much better to play with this rather than that laggy one anyway same thing again only this time we don't necessarily see the same you know crazy move upward as we you know, bet with larger percentages but I wonder if we added more wagers, we would see such a thing. But at least for now, we don't really see that. Wager count, though, it does look to me like at least this one goes quite a bit up. And then losing, I don't know, sort of stays the same. Almost looks like a X, maybe a N here. <laughs> it's writing a message to us. Anyway, this one looks a little bit less correlated. But I would, like I said, wager that maybe if we added more um, samples to this one we would see more but this one takes a really long time to get any samples at all um, but at least for like wins and losses it doesn't really look too too crazy we do see quite a few clumps right here and quite a few clumps here though so it looks like if you want to do like just get it over with really quickly uh, you need to do about 9,000 wagers <laughs> with a percentage size of approximately eight or so percent anyway um, really what we should do too is check a wager percent size let's see how big was that wager percent that I was running here uh, conserv very conserv see. conservative creator because that could be an interesting change as well um, Yeah, our wager size we were allowing to be, I guess wager size is, yeah, because we do wager size, but that's a wager size percent. Where did it go? Come back. Right. It's interesting that we literally don't have anything of a smaller wager percentage size than really three. I'm not sure if there's an error in my code or what, but in theory we should have had a smaller one, especially with some of the successful guys, they should have had smaller wager sizes. But that's my whole point with this strategy is in order for it to be, you know, strongly successful on a large scale across a lot of bettors, you've got to bet a tiny amount. And if you bet that tiny amount, you're not going to make much money in the end. It's going to be a very boring, you know, 0.01% return or 1% return or whatever. Anyway, um, I guess that's pretty much it with this uh, tutorial series. Um, so that's the Monte Carlo simulator in Python. From here, you can use this for all sorts of things. At the end, we, we search for variables that would give us a result of something greater than something, right, or less than something. Uh, you can also search for vars that'll give you a range. So an example of this is when Monte Carlo simulations are used to calculate pi, for example. 
This is done by, we have the end result at the end, which is the radius of this um, circle. We know what the end result we want it to be. It's the edge of the circle. Now what is going to give us um, that edge? Well, we can use the Monte Carlo simulator to just generate random numbers and see, did we get close to that edge of the circle? And if we did, if we got within, let's say, 0 0.0001 percentage of that circle, then hot damn, we just found a, a, a worthy candidate. And we do this over a million samples, or a few million, and we can estimate pi. And you can do it very closely to what pi is, and generate this extremely fast, actually. Um, and you don't actually need to know how to calculate pi. You just have to use the Monte Carlo simulator to literally brute force the answer for you. So we made ourselves the simulator. Uh, we tested against a few betting types, trying to find out you know the best strategy as well as strategy outcomes. Um, I think our findings seem pretty obvious to me, and that's that there's really no way to beat odds to a large degree. The Day Allen Bear strategy does do well in terms of a steady, reliable profit as compared to a steady, reliable loss over time if your wager size is small enough in comparison to your full amount of funds. But this means a wager size of like less than one one millionth of your total like in, uh, gambling funds. So in this case, you stand to gain a f tiny fraction of a percent of gain over a long time long term. In the end, a wager this small and the time required to make a profit off of a wager size this small means you're really just wasting your time uh, with the strategy. So most people gamble for you know the excitement, either knowingly or unknowingly because they've become addicted to it. Um, a lot of people do gamble with the intention to make money. And I imagine a few people even watched this series and actually you know, heard of the Monte Carlo simulation and strategy because of its relationship with odds and gambling and finding things out, hoping to maybe learn a new skill and make money. And maybe I'll have saved you, saved you money, uh, but that's the best I have besides teaching you some programming skills. So in, in the end, gambling should really just be for fun. As soon as you decide to gamble for profit, you're setting yourself up immediately for failure and depression and all kinds of nasty things. Um, so anyways, in the end, I, I think at least the most fascinating part to me um, with all of this is the degree that randomness plays, especially when concerning outliers, but even concerning huge pools of data um, where we get an answer and then we run a huge pool of data again and get a totally different answer. <laughs> Um, and so that is really fascinating when you concern outliers and the far outliers are heavily influenced by pure randomness so the extreme cases are almost solely based on randomness and nothing more not the strategy nothing else no outside element it's just randomness that gave them that that outside outlier status and in today's world the outliers of anything are often looked you know, look towards with either admiration or discontent, depending on which di which direction they outlie, right? And usually with very little appreciation to the randomness that played the role in their path, especially when you consider stock traders and investors and all of this. It's just statistically is going to be the case that there are going to be very successful people and very unsuccessful people, regardless of you know what strategy they use and you can even use a very good strategy and still lose a lot of money or you can use kind of a poor strategy and still make a lot of money even when the odds are stacked against you so anyways I hope you all enjoy the series I had a lot of fun making it and like quite a few of my series I really just made this as I went so there could very possibly be errors in the code I do encourage you guys to read it over test it don't use it to actually gamble or trade or whatever and develop your own code entirely. So it was just really for educational use and uh, hopefully some people had fun or maybe learned some of the things. So as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support and subscriptions and until next time.